Happy Sabbath again. I have a chance to see you closer now. In December 1844, in a family of a young lady who is known as Mrs. Hines, something special happened to a group of ladies that were praying together. Maybe we have heard that story. A vision from God came to one of them, the weakest, maybe. And in that vision, she saw a narrow path. And she saw the people of God walking from the world onto heaven. And Jesus was waiting for them and motivating them. Those who kept looking at Jesus walk straight. But those who get disappointed, they just fall and came back to the world. After the vision, it was already a great sight for her. But something greater happened is that the Lord asked her to share that vision with others. Oh, what a problem. Who am I? A weak lady with only a third grade of education. How can I go and tell others? Adults, married, professionals, ministers, that Jesus is coming and that we were mistaken. You know that this lady's name is Ellen G. White. And today you know that he said the message and we are part of that story. What can God do with people who is incapable of doing great things? What great things can God do with people who is just simple regular people of the world. We that maybe we are not the most prepared, the most qualified, the most trained people. What can he do? Today's message entitled is entitled, Who Am I? I'll be speaking about a man that we know because of his greatness, but not always he was that great. Maybe when we speak about Moses, we remember his greatest successes. But now I will speak about one-third of his life, the dark part of it. This part that the Bible don't mention very much and that we don't think about it too long. But it is just a few verses in the Bible. But that presents a man that as you and I has a lot to do for God, but we just has to trust again. Who am I? Let us pray. Dear Father, we give you thanks this morning. Because you have invited us to your presence to speak to us and to remind us your power and your greatness. Let us speak about you with confidence and let others know that you are the Almighty and that you have control about everything. Send powerful angels to protect our minds so we will not be distracted as we hear your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Please come with me to Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blessing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses started in amazement, though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This starts another part of Moses' story that happens 40 years after the end of Exodus chapter 2, when he fled from Egypt going to Midian, trying to save his life from his past. Now, 40 years later, he was attending the flock, but not his. It was from his father-in-law. Even he was 80 years of age, he didn't have a cattle for himself. He was protecting his father-in-laws because he had nothing. There is not a retirement plan for him. He had no savings. He hadn't any expectation, and he was already 80, so maybe you'll know mm, he's in a big trouble, right? Moses had nothing because he expected nothing. He felt the reason of his failure in his own life. He believed that he deserved what he was facing because at the end, he was prepared and trained to be a prince, and now he's a simple pastor of sheep. He don't have an, air, an army anymore. He didn't have anything to be proud of. 
but his past was in his conscience always, reminding him what he was not anymore. What a sad story. What a sad reality for his family. I imagine his wife, his son, people around him, so gifted men, so destroyed from the inside. No hope, no expectations, nothing great can happen to him because he saw himself as a failure already. Can you imagine when he had an opportunity to buy cattle? Why am I going to buy that? I can die any moment. So just leave it like that. His wife trying to have a bigger house. And he said, why a bigger house? I can leave any moment. So don't mind. Don't mind. People around him can't catch it. He was saying broken man. Destroyed by his mistakes in his past. His pride that put him in the position of killing someone. And now of running away from his life. But now, after 40 years waiting for a response, God answers, appearing in a burning bush. What happened there? May you know the story, but I would like to come with you to read a little bit in verse 7. The second part says, The Lord said to Moses, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. Wow, the Lord is giving so much. He's excited, sharing with Moses what he can do now. But Moses, <laughs> he wasn't excited. In his mind, he was afraid. What is going on now? I'm 80. Look at me. I am not the strong man that you could work with when I was 40 or 30. I was expecting you to show up when I started this revolution. But now, these people betrayed me and I'm afraid and I'm here. Look at me now. I'm here. But the Lord keeps saying to Moses what he is willing to do, what he can do on the verse, on to verse 10. Because in verse 11, Moses starts speaking. Some version says that he protested. And others only mentions his question. I would like you to come with me to this verse who was the verse of this morning. Verse 11. In this version says, But Moses protested to God. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? The question, who am I? Constant question, who am I? Who am I to do that that you say that I can do? Who am I to do that that the Lord said I can do? Who am I to be appointed to that kind of mission? Who am I was Moses' question, a rightful question, a sincere question, but not a right one. Moses expected God to give him reasons to believe in himself. Maybe he expected a motivator. He expected some positivism. Maybe he expected God to say, if you believe in yourself, anything is possible. Because that's what we see in Disney movies and in television. It's not about believing in yourself. It's about believing in your God. God came and answers to Moses something that Moses didn't reply because Moses was kind of lost. But the Lord is always in his rightful place. Verse 12, he said, God answered, I will be with you, and this is be your sign, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Lord, who am I? God's response, I will be with you. Hmm. That's not what Moses expected, but that's God's answer. It never was about Moses. It was about me, said the Lord. It's not about what are your credentials. I know about your education in Egypt, but you have learned that it doesn't work. 
I know about your time and experience, but you have learned that that means anything to me. It is not about who you are. It's about who am I, the Lord said. It's about if I am with you, anything is possible, and I will show you that I am powerful or even more than that, that I will bring my people with you to this very place. Even the proof wasn't about Moses. It was always about God. When he, ca when he calls you, he trains you. And sometimes we are afraid about God's training because we expect God's training to be like our training. Maybe in a classroom, maybe with textbook and with some syllables to know what is coming, but with God... You only know that something great is coming because he's the teacher. But above that, you have to walk by faith. And Moses had 40 years to forget that word. To forget that God is powerful. And to forget that the Lord is still taking care of his people. Even Moses believed that he was the liberator. The one who would free the Israelites from Egypt. The Lord was trying to change Moses' mind, telling him, it's about me. Trust me. I will be there. He told him his name. He told him his purposes, his plan, his projects. And Moses' brain was like, boof. A lot of things coming on. Now it is getting serious. And now you can read the Bible. And if you don't know the story that I know that many of you maybe know it, you will say, okay, now it's getting great now. Now it is coming closer. Now Moses is turning on. Now things are going on. But it didn't happen. Moses reacted as we do. Moses reacted as a human. He created excuses to stay in a comfort zone, to be safe, and to play safe, to act face. And now we'll be discussing three excuses that Moses presented to God. Chapter 4, verse 1 is the first one. Chapter 4, verse 1. But Moses protested again. What if they don't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? The first ex excuse that we put on to God. Maybe you have used it in your life. Maybe you haven't or you haven't been aware of that. But let me tell you what's the first excuse. You can write it down. You can say that to someone close to you so you can remember. The first excuse that the devil puts in your mind when the Lord is trying to call you to do something great is what others think of me. What may others think about me? So the Lord is trying to tell Moses, I will do great things with you. I will free my people through you. I am calling you to take out and to do something great. But Moses' response was, will the people believe me? What will they say? You're crazy now. What are you saying? What are you trying to say? If we don't know you, we know who you are. We remember what you, did, what you did. We know your story and everything that you have been doing. We know that you are a ghost for 40 years. And now you come rested and peacefully to tell me that you are going to free us. Well, people were suffering of slavery. Moses was hidden in the desert. And now the Lord tells him and Moses said, what will they say? What will they think? So the Lord had to speak to Moses again and give another of his great answers. Verse 2. Then the Lord asked him, What is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff. Moses replied, Lord, you see this? A shepherd's staff? That's the only thing I have now. And let me tell you, I have had in my hand greater things. I usually had to train with swords and other weapons. I had in my command a huge army a few years ago. Lord, let me tell you that I have an interest story that you can hear of how strong I, I was and how people was excited when they saw me and how people got happy. And, and, and they usually say that I was the best of the Egyptian empire fighting and using the sword. But now, Lord, what I have is only a shepherd's staff. For Moses, his shepherd's staff 
was a reminder of what he wasn't anymore. Can you be with me now? Reminder of what he wasn't. His failures. His 40 years doing something that he wasn't really trained for. Moses was prepared in every science of the Egyptians, the greatest empire, empire in the world to this time, to his time. So he was expected to be a great man, but now he's a shepherd. And the Lord is trying to call him to be a liberator, but he's only a shepherd. Moses presented God what he had in his hand. I need this to take care of the shepherds and also to walk and everything. Lord, you see me like that, but I wasn't like that always. Well, I can tell, but no, no, no. The Lord didn't ask him about his resume. He never asked him about his past. He asked him what he has in his hand because with that shepherd, the Lord will do great things. So the Lord started making miracles. He started showing what he can do with a simple shepherd's staff. Trying to show Moses that he can take anything from him and do great things with him. And if you think about turning the staff into a serpent, it's nothing if you compare it with opening the sea. But Moses had to believe with the small things to see greater things happening in the future. At that moment, the Lord took Moses' staff and he presented Moses that it wasn't him or his story that will be his testimony of God's power. God is very good calling to the wrong people. He likes choosing people with a past, with pain, with scares, with mistakes. Because when he takes you, he lets you know and people know that it is about God and his power in your life. Your secret is not, is, is not your education. Your secret is not yet the way you grew up. Your secret is not the training that you had. The secret is that your past, your story, your stuff can be used by God. So Moses had to understand this is not if they believe you, it's if they will believe me through you. When you think about what may people say, it is because you are trying to protect yourself from that. Protect yourself from judgment. Protect yourself from prejudice. Protect yourself from what others can say. But what about what the God said? What about his opinion on you? What about his expectations on you calling you his son? Something great, right? But the Lord always in the Bible take regular people and put them in places where a regular person can do nothing. But when God is with you, you are not a regular person. You're an extraordinary person. And he can do great things through you and with you if you let him do so. Amen? First excuse. What will other people think of me? The second one is close to that. And it is said in verse 11. No, verse 10. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, O oh Lord, I am not very good with words. I have never been, and I am not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. <laughs> Second excuse. What do I think about myself? Now it all said that, the most powerful words that you can hear ever are those words that you say to yourself. And I don't know if you know that, but the devil can speak to you through your thoughts. He can't read them, but he can speak to you in ways that you can believe that it is you. When you wake up on Sabbath and something tells you, maybe I better don't go to church today because I'm very tired. But you were making plans to come to church. But the Lord speaks to you in first person, trying to put uh, uh, his thoughts on you just to keep you comfortable. Sometimes he puts thoughts about people in your mind just to put in you, in your heart, a heart to dishonor or to, miss, to feel uncomfortable with them. Just to put in your heart some discomfort around things and 
sometimes it doesn't even make sense if you think about it. You dress all beautiful to come to church, and then he puts you in mind like, why do you dress up if you're ugly anyway? Hmm. And the worst thing is that you start believing that. The devil takes your self-esteem and takes you to something that the Lord can't use because you don't use yourself. You lose your faith in God, and you lose your faith in what God is doing through you when you look yourself at the mirror. So the devil takes control, and your fear takes on, and you don't move. And Moses was in the same position. First, they won't believe me. I'm not that special. But now, I'm not capable. I don't have the tools needed to lead that people. What? Moses? You that were a proud young man who believed that you can do anything and you even tried to fight for yourself trying to free these people. Now I'm coming to help you. And now you say you don't even know how to speak. What is happening to you? Stop believing. Stop trusting. What he thought about himself wasn't something that the Lord can use, could use, or at least according to Moses. But what happened there? I like God's response. Verse 11. Then the Lord asked Moses, Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak? Hear or do not hear? See or do not see? It is not I, the Lord. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Moses, you're not speaking about someone who is asking you if you can. I am the one who makes those who can. I am the one who gives you any capability in your life. I am the one who gives you any training. I am the one who gives you any gift. I am the one who created the gifts that everybody can use. So I can if I tell you so. Don't be afraid, Moses. When you read the book of Deuteronomy, you listen to a Moses. You read about a Moses giving a great speech, don't we? You hear someone who his strength has come from God and his relationship with God has been so close that he is a transformed man. And if you read through the Pentateuch, you can see a Moses being transformed. That we can even imagine that this is the Moses that the Lord found in the wilderness, a broken man, 40 years running. And now the Lord take him back to another level on his education to make him the most humble, to make him the most useful. The second fear, the second excuse that we put God is about ourselves. Because we don't believe that we can be used by God. We have been judged so much by the earthly standards that we take them for granted. And we believe that that's fine. And it is not. It is not. God's standards are those who allow us to come to him and by grace he can work and transform us. So take it and enjoy it. Because he paid for that. Third excuse. This one is a hard one. Verse 13. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. Hmm. That excuse has to do when you say others can do it. And we are good on that in church, right? Others can do it. Everybody said that anybody could do. That's so easy. Anyone, someone else can do it. That's too hard. Someone else can do it. That's like a special for brother so so and sister so so. More. No. When you put in your heart, in your mind, that mindset, something happens with God. Verse 14 says that the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. Because when you are not doing what the Lord wants you to do, because you think that others can do it, you are just saying, you can work great things, but not with me. You can change life, but not mine. You can uh, do miracles, but not with me. Lord, maybe I am too hard. Maybe my marriage is so distract 
so destroyed. Maybe my relationship with others has been so messed up. Lord, maybe you can do that. Okay, but not with me. Try with others, Lord, but not with me. Try doing great things, Lord, but please do it with others. Lack of faith. Lord, send anyone else. But the Lord wasn't calling anyone else. He called Moses because he knew that broken man was ready to be brought up again. We need to understand this, brethren. The Lord is calling you to do something great for him. Don't come here and ask him, who am I? Ask him, what do you need? Because the Lord trains those who he calls and prepares us to do his will if we are willing to see his hand moving through toward us, around us, in the midst of this community who is a church. I like that. There are many details in this chapter. The Lord answered and moved in ways that we can know that there is an intentional revelation of God's power and of God's will. If we go back and now think as a church, let's read verse 14. Because the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, because you know, the second excuse was about Moses' ability to speak. Now the Lord said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he speaks well, and look, he's on his way to meet you now. He will be delighted to see you. Sometimes we are afraid about our gifts. But the Lord puts in our midst, in our church, in our community, people who can fix our weaknesses. And we can work together in order to see great things for God happening and done constantly. So it is not only about what can I do. The Lord knows and he's working on that. Moses was afraid about speaking, but the Lord said, he's coming as we speak right now and he will be happy to see you let god take care of that because he's working on you the first excuse was about what did moses had in his hand let me tell you that this is one of the most exciting parts of my of, of my reading of that because moses staff no the staff of god now will be presented in Moses' story, his witness, his staff, his shepherd's staff, what he had, what he was like trying to hide, his past that he was trying to keep to himself, what he don't wanted people to know, what was his, his profession when God found him. Now, that profession is valuable for God. And verse 17 says, And take your shepherd's staff with you and use it to perform the miraculous signs. I have shown to you. Lord, but I expected you to have me train and change my clothes and look like better so I can show it up like I am now neat and clean and I can be a leader. No, 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 no. I don't need you to present yourself. I need you to present me. So take what you are and let me use it for my sake. Sometimes we believe that the Lord is trying to change us in ways that the people can't be uh, impressed but no he's trying to change our lives because he wants the best of us but when God transforms you it's not for you to show up it's for him to show up in you it's not about I'm dressing more expensive clothes now because I want people to know that I'm sharp no 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 no, no. it's about now I'm dressing God's gatherings his patience his love his mercy i'm blessing i'm blessed by his spirit so people may know that even with what i'm dressing even with what i have on the lord he's showing up through me all the way so people may know that he's in control that's how he is that's how he likes maybe i'm speaking to someone who has been asking himself to God in many times of his life, who am I? 
Maybe that kind of things can be done in other churches. Maybe that can be done in other leaders. Maybe someone else can come and do what you want, Lord, but I don't know how to take this church, how to move the things, how to... No, 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 no. This is not about we and our fears. It is not about we and our past. It is not about that. It's about if we are willing to let God take control of us, take control of his church, take control of our lives, and he will do it. And let me tell you the greatest thing that I can hear now. I can read now. Verse 16. God said to Moses, Aaron will be your spokesman to the people. He will be your mouthpiece. And you will stand in place of God for him, telling him what to say. Moses, a broken, depressing man, now in place of God to the people. Yes. Because God wants to use broken people to show the world that he can build when others destroyed. We need to become a place where people shall hear and know that. When people can experience that we love them, not because they're perfect, but because love, God loved them with a perfect love. Where broken people can come together as we and feel like a family of people converted and recreated by God. Where people can know that it is not about who they are. It is about who God is. And the Lord will show them as he's showing us that he's in control. At the end of the story, what will happen with that Moses? I like always, I like to remind the picture of Moses in the Mount of, Transfig of the Transfiguration. You remember? Jesus was there facing one of the beginning of the end of, of his passion. And then Jesus was there to pray and then appeared a great light. And Moses came in and said, Jesus, you remember when you found me? You remember how I was? You remember how depressed I was? You remember how tired I was? Jesus. If you save me, you can save all the world. So please, Jesus, hold on. God is so loving and merciful that allowed a simple, destroyed man to be his advisor. But that's how he does. Because he wants us to know that he cares. It doesn't matter how you see yourself. He's trying to show you who he, to who he is. In my life, I've seen God working with imperfect people because I am one. I decided to be a pastor since when I was very young. Maybe I mentioned that here or somewhere. But I decided to be a pastor since when I was eight years old. So I trained myself, or no, I expected to be trained to serve God since the beginning. But I was a regular teenager, proud, disrespectful, violent, and anything you can put in. It was until my 16th anniversary when I decided to do some changes and try to see if the Lord was willing to work with me, even though I had eight years of rebellious behavior. When you said Montillita in my place, or Montilla Small, was the sons of my father, you were saying that the worst kids of the church. We bullied people. We were angry, noisy, and our behavior wasn't the best. I was saved by the Pathfinder clubs, but I wasn't the best Pathfinder either. I enjoyed the competition. I enjoyed the fights. I enjoyed all the stuff. And even though I was changed by many parts of my growth process, many people never saw me as a pastor. When I started to study theology, some people said, if Omar now is a pastor, anything can be a pastor. <laughs> so you can see the expectations on the community. Another problem was that I was a stutter. I couldn't speak. So my teenage years, I couldn't say M-N-U-L. I couldn't say Lala. I couldn't say mine. I couldn't say things like that. So people said, how can you be a pastor if you can't even speak? How can you be a pastor if you behave that bad? How can you, how can you? 
But there was a moment, I told you when I turned 16, that I said, if this is still for me and you are still interested in training, and working with me, Lord, I will like to know you. So I start reading the Bible again. The spirit of prophecy again. Steps to Christ. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. The side of ages. That kind of things. I wasn't making a project to show off to the people that I'm a transformed teenager now. Hey, people, now I'm new. Hey, look at me now. I'm reading the Bible. I have books on my side. No, 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 no. It, it is not like that. I start trusting and looking to know my God. And people start noticing things and changes. I remember one of those picky elders in church, those who are taking care of everything and always behind of me. Brother Victor told me once, Brother Omar, something is happening. I don't know if you know, but you are being, trans you have, you are being transformed by God. I see that you are different, and I praise God for that. And I'm praying for you, so I'm happy of what God is doing with you. Let me tell you something. I remember that because that made a strict, a great impact in my life. I can't come now and tell the church that so me, growing up, I'm a new man. <laughs> I'm not that fake. But the people start noticing that. And the Lord start showing himself through my bad behavior, now turning it into uh, not that bad behavior. Other thing was when I spoke. I couldn't speak to you when I am, was off, but then when I went into the pulpit, I can speak freely. And people start saying, oh, no, he's not stutter. He's just joking with another of his jokes. He's just being rebellious again. So he can speak, but we... We just didn't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was God's mercy. Every time I came onto the pulpit, I spoke freely and comfortable. I can sing and speak, and people started believing that something maybe can show up from this boy. But the miracle was every time, right there, when I had to go in front and face my fears and speak about God and the scripture, and he let me be understandable, maybe as little as now. But now I want to invite you to see in your life who do you think you are and to understand that the Lord is not asking you about this. It is what you think you have to answer, but it is not what he's looking for. He's not looking for people capable. He's not looking for people uh, uh, with the credentials, with the training. He's not looking for that. He's looking for people willing to walk with him. Willing to say, if you are with me, I will go there. It was Moses who said, if you are not with us, I will stay here because I will not move if you are not here. The Lord is looking for people who can face his challenges. What people think, leave that to me, the Lord says. What do I think? Leave it that to me, the Lord says. Send someone. No, no, no. Send me. Okay. Now the Lord can. They say, that's what I'm speaking about. And the Lord will take you, not even about who you think you are, but about who he is. And for his love, for his people, for his church, and for those who are lost, he will use you to be a blessing for others. Brethren, this has never been about us. Always, it is about him. So if you have been betrayed, and if you have a past to face, welcome to the club. But remember, it is not about who you are. It's about him. He's good taking the wrong people and turning them onto the right ones. Because he's the one who can transform lives. Let me pray for you. Dear Father, we give you thanks because when we hear you speak, our hopes, our spirit comes back again. And you remind us that we are the people you have in this church because you have a project for this church. And we are your project. We are your plan. And we are those who are taking the benefit of your love today. 
let us see you close to us. Let us understand your call and your invitation. And please, let us respond to you. Here I am. Send me. So we may see your miracles as Moses did. And see the transformation of our history, of our history onto your great history in this place. In your name we pray. Amen.